Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares, and by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host of The Last Symptom. Really happy to have you back here with me this week. Boy, you want to talk about some heat and humidity. It has been hot and humid around where I'm at. I'm wondering where I, uh, about how it's like where all you folks are at. Hopefully, uh, not quite as hot or humid where where I am. And you know, uh, I've been looking at the forecast, and the uh, meteorologist. The reason I'm laughing is because in Spanish, there's a saying, "Mentirologo." It's a play on words. It's kind of like a combination of uh, meteorologist and liar, <laughs> which more often than not, at least here where I'm at, uh, seems to be the case. Keep watching the forecast. It's been promising. All these thunderstorms, they never materialize. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I've been listening to thunder for the past four hours. And it just doesn't materialize into anything. And let me tell you why I'm bothered by that. At least where I'm at, a really strong thunderstorm, summer thunderstorm, would drop the humidity in an instant. And then um, there'd be a couple of days of low humidity days, which would make all the difference in the world. So for days now, days and days, I've just been praying for one of these thunderstorms to materialize into something real to bring the humidity down, and it just doesn't happen. So uh, that's Mother Nature's way of jerking my chain, I reckon. We're going to talk about some nice things today. We're going to talk about insight. Also, I'm going to tell you a story, a true story, about... 1-800-HOWS-MY-DRIVING You've seen those uh, bumper stickers, haven't you? you know, you'll be driving behind somebody and you'll see the bumper sticker that says 1-800 well, depending on where you're at I don't know if you I'm guessing that in the UK or down under in India uh, you folks outside the United States probably don't use 1-800 numbers but here you'll see bumper stickers on the back of like service vehicles that say 1-800 how's my driving so here in the United States a 1-800 number is a toll free number so you just call it if you're behind like the telephone man or something like that and he's driving like a a maniac uh, you can dial that number and and report him so I'm going to tell you a story about that also to close out the show today I'm going to share some quotes with you at the end of the show that will hopefully put human intellectuals into context for you you know I think that uh, with this past year with the pandemic uh, that a lot of people were caught off guard by that you know they're looking to uh, the people who are supposed to know lots of things and getting uh, terrible information from them and then that information changes the next day, and then it changes the next day, and it changes the next day. And uh, so a lot of people probably like uh, thinking, what's going on here? And I tend to think that uh, anybody who was caught like that probably, probably had too much 
irrational or blind trust in human intellectuals to begin with but you know we'll i'll just share some quotes for, uh, with you that uh, and you can come to your own conclusions about that before we get into today's topics let me tell you about thelastsymptom.com that's my website full of free resources tons and tons of information there for you to consume uh, at no cost to you but I've also got some paid services and those services are one-on-one phone calls with me one-on-one zoom video conferences with me and of course the last symptom fundamentals course which is a two-week intensive course who's it designed for now you might think that this thing is strictly for people who have borderline personality disorder but that ain't true it would be just as beneficial this two-week intensive pre-recorded course would be just as beneficial for anybody with an emotional disorder and why is that because emotional disorders all sprout from the same root causes that's right it doesn't matter if you have narcissistic personality disorder instead of borderline personality disorder this course is for you it doesn't matter if you have never been formally diagnosed with borderline personality disorder if you can identify with a lot of the the underlying issues that we talk about here the last symptom fundamentals course is for you it's for anybody who wants to understand themselves better the underlying issues they're dealing with better the sorts of families that come from better and to authentically escape these emotional disorders so if you'd like to look into that uh, I highly encourage you to run over to thelastsymptom.com in the paid services tab you scroll down and there it is the last symptom fundamentals course there's even a a short I think it's a 30 minute video that you can watch there just to kind of get a feel for what that course is all about and to see if it's something for you if you decide to enroll in that course I really appreciate it it goes a long way in supporting everything that I do with the last symptom just like to mention that donations continue to be an important aspect of my work and so if you're so inclined um, I'd encourage you to do that through thelastsymptom.com but you know as I've mentioned a few times in the past now that the the last symptom social media premier group is on the locals platform instead of sending me a hundred dollar donation why not just uh, join us there on locals and if you want to be a supporter there that's seven dollars a month so it's a very very modest amount for each individual but combined with the whole community uh, it, that translates into a very real uh, significant support for my ongoing work and uh, the nice thing about it is that you get daily content from me so I'm publishing these daily orange slash videos which are condensed video insights uh, you get uh, to interact with me daily on the group you get to interact with the other members of the group and the community there just continues to grow and become more and more active I'm I can't wait to see where it might be in just a couple years so that's all I'll talk to you about that let me tell you about this 1-800 how's my driving number as I say here in the United States we often see bumper stickers on service vehicles you know like the telephone man's truck or the cable man's van or uh, any business might have it added to the back of their uh, company vehicles to sort of keep their employees in line I reckon but uh, I don't remember really seeing these things begin to appear until about oh 20 years ago or so <laughs> of course the older you get um, the harder it is to gauge time like that so it might have been 30 years ago 
but you know you'll you always see them around and i'm curious actually about whether you folks out there outside the u.s has some have something similar that that you see in your your own countries you know if you'd like to to share about that you know that's a perfect excuse for you to join us on the locals platform by the way i didn't mention how you you join us you can do it two ways you can go to the last symptom dot locals l-o-c-a-l-s dot com or you can download the locals app from the app store and just search for the last symptom but anyway you know this would be a great discussion for us to have <laughs> on the local uh, on the uh, the last symptom community there so i'm curious about what you folks have in your own countries but here in the u.s we have this 1-800 how's my driving bumper sticker and uh, for years i mean for probably 20 years uh, i drove around seeing these things all over the place and just thinking i wonder what that's all about you know i wonder if anybody ever calls those things so t- 10 years ago probably longer than that anyway while i was living in philly and i was still married to my ex-wife diana who you've heard me talk about uh, i was working at the hospital there in uh, elkins park pennsylvania just a suburb just right on the outside of philadelphia the city i mean right on the outskirts so i worked in elkins park for years and uh, we lived in hatboro at that time i got off work one day from elkins park and i was just driving home worn out i can't tell you how mentally exhausting being a a spanish medical interpreter can be because you get thrown into these really high stress situations and you really got to be on top of your game you know you're you're interpreting what somebody else is saying actually if you think about it an interpreter speaks twice as much as any normal person because the whole day you're speaking what one person says in in english you're changing that over into spanish in my case it's different depending on what language you're an interpreter in but then you know the the patients or the clients they respond and then you're saying what they're saying and you're changing that into to english and you do this all day long so i mean it is exhausting if you have a lot of cases in a single day just m- very mentally taxing so i was driving back from work and my brain was fried pretty much and uh, i saw this service truck in front of me 1-800 how's my driving and uh i don't know what it was about that day but i said you know in my head i thought i am tired of wondering about this and so i watched this guy drive (laughs) and you know what he drove perfect he was driving better than i was and i thought you know what i bet any time somebody calls one of these how's my driving numbers i bet it's always because of something negative i bet there has never been anybody in the history of mankind who has ever called one of these numbers just to say hey your guy is driving really good and i just wanted to take time out of my day to say so And so I decided that that's what I was going to do. So I got out my cell phone, dialed up that number while I was driving behind him. And the lady answered on the other side and she said, you know, hello, what vehicle are you following? And uh, he had a number on the back of his vehicle. I gave her that number. She said, okay, and uh, let's see, uh, where whereabouts are you? I told her like the street I was on. Okay, sir. I'm so sorry uh, that you're being put out today. What what can I do for you? She, you see, she's getting ready for like the worst of it. And I said, oh, no, it's nothing like that at all. I said, in fact, I, I just wanted to call and tell you that this guy, he is driving exceptionally well. I would trust him to drive me anywhere. He's just a very good driver, and, and I, you know, I just wanted to take time to uh 
compliment him. I mean, what? Why have that number on the back of the van if the only thing you're going to get is complaints? So I want. I just want to do something positive for that guy today. She was gobsmacked. She didn't know what to say, and she started laughing. And she said, "You're not kidding me." I said, "I'm not kidding you. I'm on my way home from work here, and I just thought I'd uh, take a moment, put in a good word for this guy." She says, "You don't know this guy." I said, "I don't know him. Never. He didn't come to do any work. I'm just leaving the hospital." She couldn't believe it, and. Uh, so she thanked me profusely, and I think I made her day in addition to making the the guy's day later on. But, uh, you know, I can only imagine <laughs> when that message got back to him, how he reacted to that. But um, I got home. I didn't think anything about it. But my curiosity is not satisfied, right? I never in a, again, and for the rest of my life, do I have to wonder something because now I've had I've put myself out there going out on a limb I've had the experience personally I know exactly <laughs> what calling these 1-800 how's my driving uh, bumper stickers is like so again I just forgot completely about it and uh, went about my life and got home to my wife and you know we hung out and I don't remember what went on that day but I remember uh, about oh probably six months passed and uh, we got invited to supper at our friend's house, Jim and Becky. And we went to have supper with them, and we had some wine. We're sitting around telling stories and everything. And uh, Jim worked for the phone company. And somehow our conversation got on the 1 800 How's My Driving bumper sticker. I think he was just joking around, but he, he mentioned it. And that jostled my memory that I had done that so I told that story to them I said oh you know speaking of which I forgot that uh, I called one of those numbers and they said oh really why was the guy being a real jerk or was he driving like a maniac and I said no no it's completely the contrary guy was driving really good and I just thought well I'm gonna call and, and let let them know it <laughs> the whole uh, group of us, they all burst into uh, laugh, laughter. They laughed so hard that they were in tears. And I didn't understand what was so funny about it. And uh, I guess that's just the difference between city folk. You know, people live at, have been raised and grew up in a major city like Philadelphia. And me, coming from Appalachia, and just being myself it was so foreign to them the whole notion of calling one of those numbers because somebody's driving well it just had never occurred to them in their entire life it would have never occurred to them and but that's why i remember that uh, them laughing hysterically over that and uh, i even remember verbatim what my ex-wife diana said through streaming tears as she was trying to to regain her composure she said uh, boy uh, she said you don't often surprise me but when you do <laughs> she said <laughs> it is epic it is epic so that's a memory that uh, I treasure I hold on to that really dearly because uh, I don't think I'd ever seen me make my wife laugh well there was a time I made her laugh that hard uh, we were backing out of a a restaurant called uh, Bob Evans in Philly. Now, Bob Evans is, originates where in the general location where I'm from, and there's not a lot of them in Philly. I remember us backing out one day, and I had a toothpick in my mouth. We just got done eating there, and uh, I was looking over my shoulder, and I said, "Well, I reckon we'll be pulling on out of here." And for some reason, she thought that was so funny. She says, that, that's like something out of a movie that somebody would say. I, I can't believe anybody would actually talk like that. And for me, it was just so natural, you know. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's what popped into my head. That's what I said. It was totally natural. But she laughed herself almost into tears that time, too. 
All right, well, <clears throat> we really need to get into today's topic, you know, make this official and legit. So let's talk about insight. Let's talk about insight a little bit. I can't tell you how many times somebody has said to me, Hi there, I haven't had time to consume your work, but how do I cure myself? I, I've had this message in emails. I even had a doctor from Vegas one time schedule a, a Zoom appointment with me. Now, you got to understand, for me, if I have a Zoom appointment during the day, that means I have to really build my day around that. Um, I can't just show up looking any old way. I got to, you know, make myself look pretty, get dressed up and respectable, and uh, be prepared. I got to prepare my mind for whatever we might be discussing. So it, it takes a big chunk out of my day sat down with him he says uh, I haven't had time to consume your work but uh, I made this appointment so that you could tell me how I cure myself <laughs> well I said uh, probably what you need to do is you need to start con- you know you need to start consuming the fr- all the free resources I provide you know there are there's three years worth of podcasts now episodes of this podcast have you listened to any of those? No, no, I haven't real had time to do that. Um, so we talked. I tried my best to help him. We talked for an hour and a half. An hour and a half. Now, the appointment technically is scheduled for an hour. I gave him an hour and a half of my time. No limits, no cutoff, no, well, see you next week type of stuff. And he was upset with me. He was still upset with me. Now, you know, the reality is that he was not upset with me. He was upset with himself. He was upset with himself and with his situation. But he was taking it out on me. And at the end of an hour and a half, I I said, well, what would you like me to do for you? He said, I'd like a refund. And that kind of burned my bacon, but I, I didn't, uh, I didn't respond right away, and I, th- I thought about it quickly in my head. I thought he doesn't deserve a refund. <laughs> um, he's he's put himself in this situation. Yeah, you know, he had, uh, he made the appointment on my website. He had access to all of the free information that I provide there. He, he just didn't do it he just didn't take care of himself that way and so he spontaneously made this appointment expecting the impossible that I'm going to give him some kind of secret chant or something I don't know that's going to just fix him in an hour so he's done this to himself Um, and then I thought but if I show some graciousness now and some flexibility he might remember that later on he might remember that and he might come back and have a second chance so I said all right all right Um, I will I will give you a refund and then he said something mean and I said well (laughs) oh he's I know what he said he said "Uh, I feel like you've wasted my time tonight I said, well, that makes two of us, to be honest, because, uh, you know, I've had to set aside my entire evening to sit here with you, and and what did I get out of it? I got nothing out of it. My work has gotten no support out of it. So uh, I understand your feelings, and I I feel that way too. So that's kind of how we left it. But, you know, I have hopes that the guy will remember my act of... uh, patience and compassion and exceeding understanding in that situation and we'll come back but back to the the point i haven't had time to consume your work but just tell me how do i cure myself that's what we're talking about 
how exactly am I supposed to answer that? Imagine I go to NASA. You all know what NASA is. You know, I know that most of you here in the States do. I, I'm just uh, thinking about my broader audience. NASA is the, the space agency here in the United States. So imagine I go to NASA and I say, look, fellers, I, I haven't really had time to look into the information you folks all make public, but uh, just keeping it brief and simple, I'd like you all to tell me how I can get to the moon by Friday. Why are you guys looking at me like that? It's a simple question. How do I get to the moon by Friday? (laughs) What, nobody? Nobody wants to help me out there? You see, there are no shortcuts. And there's not a lot of value in the type of attitude that is looking for shortcuts. Each person has to individually can't stress that enough individually put the time and effort for their own recovery and the formula for authentic recovery is number one hope number two sincerity or genuineness number three accurate information or education Number four, insight. Ah, I remember that's the topic today. And number five, time. You know, I used to start with sincerity or genuineness as my number one uh, ingredient in the formula. And then I realized that if a person doesn't even have hope, like if a person doesn't even believe it's possible at all, then nothing else in that formula works so that's why now I correctly list hope as being the number one ingredient in the formula for authentic recovery it's huge hope because if you think about it if you don't believe a thing is possible for all intents and purposes it's not possible you see it doesn't matter if it's really possible in reality If you don't believe it is because if you don't believe it is you the one that has to motivate yourself the one that has to do the work the one that has to set goals the one that has to reach those goals will put a wall right where you think you can get to and not exceed beyond hope on the other hand says wait a second somebody's done it this Barnett character over at the last symptom and if he's done it then perhaps I can achieve that for myself too hope number one but anyway that's the formula and as you can see I really only have any control whatsoever over a very tiny element of that formula do you remember, do you know what part that is? That's uh, number three, the accurate information part. The rest of it is up to you, and I can't do it for you. Even if you take the Last Symptom Fundamentals course, which is an intensive course providing you with the entire foundation of everything you need to know, to build up from successfully you still have to do the building inside is a rare special quality inside takes knowledge to a whole new level and for insight to occur A person must spend time ruminating on the knowledge that they have gained until 
they begin to see all the deeper implications of what it all means. I think I even mentioned this in the last symptom course, uh, fundamentals course, that ruminating comes from rumen. Now, some of you in Libya, perhaps, uh, anywhere where you, you know, you, you folks uh, have a closer relationship to uh, uh, traditional uh, types of jobs like sheep herding and stuff like that. Um, anybody who is familiar with uh, ganado, which is like game or uh, uh, domesticated farm animals and that sort of thing, know that cud chewing animals have rumens. So, uh, you know, the most common is a cow. Cow has a rumen. Now, do you know what a rumen is? It, it's kind of a, a secondary kind of false stomach. So the cow will eat a bunch of grass or whatever, swallow that grass into its rumen. Why do you f- suppose it does that? Because later it regurgitates that grass out of its rumen to chew over it more thoroughly. Oh, you're starting to see where the word ruminate comes from. That's what it is. We learn something. We, we sit and we think about it. We meditate on it. Well, then we got to go and do something else, right? You can't just sit there for 10 years thinking about one thing. But later, we pull it back up. We regurgitate the thing we learned and we chew over it some more. That is what ruminating is. So let me say again what I just finished saying now that you have this understanding of what ruminating is. I said that insight is a rare, special quality. It takes knowledge to a whole new level. And for insight to occur, a person must spend time ruminating on the knowledge that they have gained until they begin to see all the deeper implications of what it all means. You know, knowledge, knowledge by itself is a, it's a very superficial thing. In fact, if you want to know just how superficial it is, you should see this week's uh, orange slices, Monday's orange slice and today uh, Wednesday's orange slice they were doozies <laughs> but they they illustrate really well how knowledge knowledge is kind of a superficial thing I was reading not too long ago of one writer's concept of who has been the smartest person who ever lived While telling the life story of his chosen person, the writer made the argument that this person was the smartest, quote-unquote, person of all time because he was very mathematically skilled. But the article ends with a kicker. This smartest, quote-unquote, person of all time died before he even reached 30 years of age because because he dueled over a woman and lost does that seem very smart to you in fact it's just plain stupid let's just call a duck a duck that is plain stupid The reality is that the guy that this writer worships as being the smartest person who ever lived, because he's good at math, wasn't very smart at all. Interestingly, the writer himself, when I checked his credentials, he himself was a scientist mathematician. Do you suppose that had anything to do with his judgment of what qualifies a person as smart? 
Or do you suppose that maybe it blinded him to just how really not smart his favorite person was? You know, if you're dead, you can't very well work out math problems, can you? Being good at math makes you skilled. Skilled. It doesn't necessarily make you smart. And not too long ago, a lot of people were talking about Anthony Bourdain, and I will not speak ill of the dead, but I will speak truthfully of the situation. Anthony Bourdain, the celebrity chef who uh, killed himself. And right after he did this, people were lapping up all of his quotes and his life advice. You still see it on the internet sometimes. Picture of Anthony Bourdain meeting out some you know, profound wisdom in a meme. But now here's the thing. I enjoyed Anthony Bourdain's shows as much as anybody. And yes, the, the man was a likable person. Extremely likable. But quoting him living your life by and making choices based on his advice there's nothing smart about that after all what did any of this advice ultimately do for him and his inner contentment absolutely nothing the man who is telling you that you should travel as much as you can and that this is the secret to living a really great, fulfilling life. He himself traveled more than anybody. Who traveled more than Anthony Bourdain? Did it bring him inner peace or genuine contentment? How did his life end up? You see, insight is seeing through the surface of things, of narratives and information, and getting a glimpse at the real nature of things and the greater implications of it all. Insight does not usually happen automatically. Sometimes it does, such as in moments when we experience an epiphany or revelation, you know, In the case of my own authentic recovery from borderline personality disorder, I had two moments of just tremendous epiphanies where, yes, along with the epiphanies, I gained instant insight, deep insight into some very relevant things. But much more often, it requires a quiet mind and crunch, 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 rumination. We learn a bunch of stuff. That's knowledge. And then we sit with it and we chew on it for a long, long time. That's rumination. And sometimes this results in insight. It's worth doing. Now several factors affect this, such as the type of information we're ruminating on, whether or not that information is accurate, our readiness to accept whatever insights might be waiting for us, and so forth. You see, NASA can dump a bunch of technical information on my lap about how to get to the moon. I can read it and have the knowledge, you know, I can extract from that information knowledge about the technicalities involved. But insight, insight is being able to understand what it's truly going to be like alone in a small capsule in space. It's being able to imagine the sounds that I might hear of the small clinks and clangs of the metallic parts of the capsule shifting. How about this? The inability to perceive any velocity whatsoever in deep space maybe you've imagined it like zooming along in a car and that's not what what it's like because you've got nothing around you except for stars which are 
you know, thousands of light years away. You have no gauge. Once you get into out, outer space, of moving at all. Yeah. According to you, it would be. I'll tell you what it'd be like. It'd be like uh, in an airplane. You know, if you, have you've ever flown um, in the middle of the night on a perfectly calm night, you can't even tell the airplane's moving. Now that's what it would be like for three days if you're going to the moon. So the inability to perceive any velocity whatsoever in deep space, you know, it's going to feel like you're sitting dead still, even though you're zipping along at 400,000 miles per hour. Insight is knowing what it's going to feel like to be left alone on the moon if for some reason you can't get back. The regrets that you're likely to feel in that situation, how your chest might ache with homesickness when you look up at the sky and see the bright earth hanging there far beyond your reach. What foods will you yearn for back home? How quickly will you get sick of being stuck inside of a stifling, bulky suit, of being confined to a tiny space capsule? When will the claustrophobia finally get to you, and what will you do about it? There's no hot showers on the moon, ladies. Guys, no recliners and big screen televisions. See, all of this ruminating creates insights. It goes beyond the knowledge. It goes beyond just the facts. I'm using NASA and the moon here as a fun example, but hopefully you can see the serious nature of what insight involves and why it matters. Insight's not something that we have discussed much on its own, on its very own, but it is a non-negotiable crucial part of authentic recovery and it is something only you can bring about. While you're going along learning the technicalities of emotional disorder, emotional unhealth, borderline personality disorder, and the behaviors that go along with these sorts of things and the, the underlying causes, make sure that you engage in lots of rumination with your objective being to gain insight. Insight is what is really going to bring everything you are learning together for you and ultimately have the greatest long-term positive effect on your recovery. That's why insight is the aspect of recovery that I wanted to highlight this week. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not done yet, but I'm going to say goodbye to you now and hope that uh, you have a wonderful week, that you have an even better weekend. Please take care of yourselves out there. You know, I, I take for granted the fact that where I'm at, uh, the pandemic is all but over. Um, it, it Life is totally back to normal. It, it has been now for, for months. And... Uh, I guess I kind of take for granted that uh, it's like that for me where I'm at currently. I understand that uh, some of you in other parts of the world uh, do not, uh, life has not gotten back to that point yet for you. So I just want to pause, let you know I'm thinking about you. Uh, hang in there. Uh, the vaccines are coming. If you don't want a vaccine, well, um, plenty of other people will that will allow society to begin opening up again you you just hang in there we're you're near the end of this thing now to close i wanted to share with you these quotes and uh, as far as i have been able to determine these are true quotes throughout history that may put human intellectuals into context for you if you begin to see a pattern Maybe it's time to begin pulling away from uh, a total faith in these um, flawed sources of knowledge and wisdom. Here we go. You ready? 
Man will never reach the moon, regardless of all future scientific advances. That's by Dr. Lee DeForest, the father of radio and grandfather of television. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943. This one will make you snort milk out your nose. $640,000 ought to be enough for anybody. Bill Gates in 1981. The concept is interesting and well-formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. That's Yale University management professor in response to Fred Smith's paper proposing reliable overnight delivery service. Smith went on to found Federal Express. Drill for oil? You mean drill into the ground and try to find oil? You're crazy. Drillers who Edwin L. Drake tried to enlist to his project to drill for oil in 1859. Airplanes are interesting toys, but of no military value. That is the professor of strategy of France. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Charles H. Dwell, Commissioner, U.S. Office of Patents, 1899. Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is ridiculous fiction. Pierre Paget, Professor of Physiology, 1872. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, President, Chairman and Founder of Digital Equipment Corps, 1977. The supercomputer is technologically impossible it would take all of the water that flows over Niagara Falls to cool the heat by the number of vacuum tubes required. Professor of Electrical Engineering, New York University. Stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Irving Fisher, Professor of Economics, Yale University, 1929. This one's funny. Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. Popular Mechanics, Forecasting the Relentless March of Science, 1949. The wireless music box has no imaginable commercial value. Who would pay for a message sent to nobody in particular? David Sarnoff's associates in response to his urgings for investment in the radio in the 1920s. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union Internal Memo, 1876. And finally, the bomb will never go off. I speak as an expert in explosives. Admiral William Leahy, U.S. Atomic Bomb Project. Thank you.